So let's do a brief recap. In our first substantive lecture, we looked at Epicurean arguments from Epicurus and Lucretius to the effect that death is not intrinsically bad. Epicurus argues that death isn't something I'm ever going to experience, and since I can't experience its badness, it can't be bad for me. And Lucretius notes a asymmetry in our thinking, that if the period of non-existence after my death troubles me, why am I not troubled by the period of non-existence before my birth? In response to these arguments, we saw that Thomas Nagel builds a fairly sophisticated argument that's based on the idea that having a life is intrinsically good, and anything that deprives, of us, uh, deprives us of an intrinsic good is intrinsically bad. Death is a deprivation of life, therefore death is intrinsically bad. We saw Williams give a slightly different argument for the intrinsic badness of death. In his case, his argument was built upon the idea of categorical desires. Desires that give me a reason to keep on living. As long as I have categorical desires, whatsoever they be, being deprived of life means being deprived of an opportunity to realize these categorical desires, and that in itself is a bad deprivation. However, Williams added a further twist, that we don't seem to have an infinite number of categorical desires that we can coherently want, and that means that eventually we would run out of categorical desires. Certainly not within 50 or 80 or 100 or 150 years, but eventually. And so, Williams argues, immortality is also undesirable. That argument leads us to the last philosopher we're going to consider in this course, the Oxford-based Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom. Bostrom is a philosopher who's primarily concerned with future technologies and the ethical implications of them. So, for example, he's done work looking at the rise of artificial intelligence, the possibilities of human enhancement, and in the paper we're going to look at, called The Fable of the Dragon Tyrant, he turns his attention to the possibility of eliminating senescence, the age-related decline that afflicts anybody who lives beyond a certain age. Bustram presents his argument in the form of a fairy tale or a fable. He calls it the fable of the dragon tyrant. And like many fairy tales, it involves a deadly dragon, a terrorized populace, and a few brave souls who decide to take the dragon on. The story goes roughly like this. There's a land that's terrorized by a dragon. It demands a tribute of 10,000 souls every day. And the kingdom is terrorized by this. Uh, they have no option but to turn these people over to the dragon because the consequences of refusing would be even worse. And so people just get used to this idea of every day shipping out 10,000 people to feed this dragon. Now, because the dragons seem to be an inevitable part of people's lives, they turn their attention and a great deal of energy to managing the problem. The kingdom developed sophisticated logistics for managing this problem of getting 10,000 people out to the dragon every day. Meanwhile, various sages and thinkers would come up with reasons why perhaps having this dragon consume us wasn't such a bad thing after all. Not being consumed by a dragon would mean that life would go on in this dreary way. It would give life a kind of sense of purpose, and there is a kind of arrogance to be found in wanting to live indefinitely anyway. Or so the story tells us. Now, the thing is that these people didn't really put much thought to defeating the dragon because they couldn't. But, as Bostrom notes, technological change can come suddenly, and it can come in unexpected ways. And indeed, there were people who had turned their attention to the possibility of destroying the dragon. Now, the dragon was fairly strong, had armor scales, there was no way that traditional weapons would be able to defeat the dragon. But a few people devoted their energies toward developing a weapon that might be able to penetrate the dragon's scales and overcome it. Now, the dragon wasn't the only threat to the people in this kingdom. There are also rattlesnakes and tigers. And at one point, a tiger comes and devours a person. And the king devotes tremendous resources to hunting down and destroying this tiger. But while all this is going on, people don't seem to be paying much attention to the fact that there might be some anti-dragon technology. Tiger only kills one person. The dragon is killing tens of thousands every day. And indeed, the dragon is getting bigger and demanding more and more tribute from the people. But eventually, they do develop uh, a weapon that they suspect will be able to destroy the dragon. And so suddenly they realize that they have the possibility of overcoming this dragon tyrant within their grasp. 
And it's only really at this last moment that suddenly they realize the urgency of the situation. If they can deploy this weapon today rather than tomorrow, tens of thousands of lives will be saved. If they can deploy it today rather than two days from now, hundreds of thousands of lives will be saved. And so suddenly there's a real race to get this weapon ready. They get it ready, they smite the dragon tyrant, they destroy it, and the people are finally liberated at last. Now, of course, this isn't the end of the story. With the dragon gone, the whole fabric of society is going to have to be reshaped. That their whole society was organized around finding ways of providing tribute to the dragon, finding consolations for the fact that we have to be destroyed by the dragon. And of course, there would be a population explosion as soon as the dragon is destroyed. So this isn't really the end of the story so much as the beginning. Okay, cute story. But this is a philosophy lecture, not story hour. So what's the point? Well, Bostrom calls it a fable because it has a moral. And the moral basically boils down to this. The dragon tyrant is senescence. Now, it's important to emphasize this point, that we're talking not about death, but about senescence. And in that sense, we're deviating a little bit from the central topic of these lectures. Senescence is the age-related decline that is the leading cause of death among human beings. Now, if we were to eliminate senescence, there would still be things that will kill us in the same way that, you know, tigers and rattlesnakes can kill people in the fable alongside the dragon. You know, in a similar way, people can still get in car crashes and all of the rest. But the idea is that in the same way that the people realize that they can destroy the dragon tyrant, Bostrom thinks that it is at least conceivable that we might be able to arrest senescence, that there's no longer any need to die of old age. So to the extent that Bostrom is targeting senescence, this isn't really an argument against death itself, but a particular cause of death. And in that sense, he's not arguing for immortality, but rather, you might say, for an indefinite health span rather than an indefinite lifespan. And it's worth noting the structure of this argument, and in particular, the way that it's built through an analogy. It's a common form of philosophical thought experiment, where you take one case where our intuitions seem pretty straightforward and strong. In this case, we've got a fable where the dragon tyrant seems pretty unambiguously bad, defeating it seems like a pretty unambiguously good thing, and then apply it to another case where our intuitions are a little fuzzier. In this case, as Bostrom notes, there are a lot of people who don't seem to regard age-related decline and the inevitability of death as bad things. And he wants to say that if your intuitions about the dragon tyrant check out, well, there are a number of analogies to the case of senescence, and if you think the dragon tyrant is bad and defeating the dragon tyrant is good, then you should share Bostrom's view that senescence is bad and defeating senescence is good. And in case the message wasn't clear, he spells out a series of analogies that he thinks holds between the fable he's telling and the real-world instance of senescence. So, to start with, the dragon is bad, senescence is bad. Pretty straightforward analogy. Secondly, he said, notes that in the fable, people come to accept the dragon as an inescapable part of life. You know, that they treat it as an issue to be worked with, to be managed, rather than to be defeated. And that this is similarly so with us with regard to senescence. We simply accept that people are going to get old and they're going to die of old age. And we treat that as an issue to be managed and dealt with and philosophized about, rather than a threat that should be stopped. Third, people didn't anticipate that they might develop this anti-dragon technology in the fable, that it comes about somewhat unexpectedly. And similarly, for the most part, people aren't thinking about how we might eventually develop anti-aging technology. But, Bostrom thinks, that possibility is really quite conceivable and possibly around the corner. Fourth, people in the fable were more focused on maintaining the social order without considering the individual lives being lost. There was a lot of managing of the logistics of getting people to the dragon and less thinking about the horror of the fact that so many people are dying. And similarly, with regard to senescence, we seem to just be more concerned with managing the fact that there is age-related decline rather than be horrified at the fact that there is. Fifth analogy, the king was more worried about tigers and rattlesnakes than about the terrible dragon that was causing most of the death. 
And similarly, people, politically speaking, in our society tend to be more horrified at violent things like terrorism and other kinds of violent crime, and less concerned by senescence, which claims far more lives. Sixth analogy. The king's chief advisor for morality argues that being killed by the dragon gives dignity and meaning to people's lives. I touched on that briefly in my recounting of the story. Um, and likewise, Bustrom notes, a lot of philosophers argue that our mortality gives dignity and meaning to our lives. And he thinks that these arguments are as absurd as arguing that being gobbled up by a dragon is something that is important to our lives because it gives our lives dignity and meaning. Seventh analogy is that it's only just before the dragon is killed that people appreciate the urgency of the situation. And Bustrom notes that people similarly today don't seem to appreciate the urgency of the fight against senescence. As he puts it, if we find a cure for senescence in 25 years rather than 24 years, a population greater than that of Canada will die as a result. That every year that we miss in terms of finding a solution to the problem of senescence costs us tens of millions of lives that don't need to be lost. And finally, once the people kill the dragon, as I noted, that's not the end of the story, but in a sense it's a beginning. They face a whole new series of social challenges. And Bustrom notes that if we were to defeat senescence, there too we would face a whole new series of social challenges. So what are those further social challenges we might face if we were to defeat senescence? Bustrom really, in his short essay, focuses primarily on the issue of overpopulation. If people stopped dying of old age, our population would grow. But he notes there are ways of coping with this. We might develop technologies that allow us to manage a larger population. Perhaps we'll develop space travel and terraforming and go out to explore new worlds. But he thinks these are problems that are manageable. However, it's worth maybe considering just how radically our sense of the meaning of our lives might shift if we were faced with a prospect that we didn't have to die of old age. And recall, we are focusing here on senescence. Now, supposing I knew that I would not die of old age, but a car crash could still kill me, I might take the issue of getting in a car a lot more seriously than I do right now. More generally, we might have a horror of accidents and accidental death that far outstrips the current horror that we face, if that's the only way in which we might end up dying, similarly with regard to violence. Now, someone like Bustrom might argue that these are good things, right? It might be good that we become much more safety conscious. It might be a good thing if we develop a deeper abhorrence of violence. But it would radically transform us. And it's worth in this context recalling also Williams' argument. Is Williams right that eventually an indefinite life would become tedious? If that's so, is senescence such a bad thing? I think Bostrom, again, would have room for an argument here. You know, he doesn't have to reject euthanasia. Perhaps we're allowed to just spend our lives for as long as we like and then choose a happy, quiet death when the time comes. Isn't that happier than having our lifespan cut short at a time not of our choosing? Certainly, there are a lot of questions here to be asked. And this is one where I think it requires a lot of imagination as well to imagine what a future world would be like where it was no longer necessary to die of old age. Is that a world we want to be in? Bustrom gives us, I think, a fairly compelling argument to think that whatever the costs of that imagined world, the rewards are tremendous. That millions of people die every year of age-related illnesses, often at the end of periods of great suffering and pain, and causing great distress and grief to those who lose them. Wouldn't it be a good thing if we could overcome that? Probably. Possibly but it does leave a lot to the imagination. So where does this leave us? We've seen a couple of arguments about the intrinsic badness of death, pro and con, and we've seen some arguments about the goodness of immortality, pro and con. We've seen Epicurus and Lucretius both provide arguments that there's nothing intrinsically bad about death, and so death is not something to be feared. And we've seen arguments from Nagel and from Williams, both arguing that death is, in fact, intrinsically bad. We also saw that Williams added a further twist by arguing that immortality is also intrinsically bad, whereas Nick Bustrom seems at least a little more optimistic about the prospect of immortality. Again, it's worth reiterating that Bustrom is concerned not with immortality so much as arresting senescence or age-related causes of death. So Bustrom isn't necessarily committed to the idea that immortality is desirable, but simply that our death is 
should be at a time of our choosing and certainly not as early as it typically happens. Now, as I've suggested earlier, I think one of the reasons that this topic might be of interest is not simply that death is a cause of stress and worry and something we might want to worry about, but also that reflecting on death is a way of reflecting on life and on its value. We saw, for instance, with Epicurus, that his argument is couched with a certain idea of what it means to have good or bad experiences. We saw that Nagel's argument rests on the idea of the intrinsic goodness of life. And in the case of Williams, we saw an argument that was based on giving a central place in our understanding of ourselves to what he calls categorical desires. Likewise, with Bustram, we've seen this issue that if we were to arrest senescence, it would raise all sorts of challenges, not just technological about how we might manage overpopulation, say, but challenges to our imagination, challenges to our sense of what it means to be alive and what it means to have a meaningful life. I don't pretend like these lectures have really resolved any of the questions I've come to look at, but that's sort of what philosophy is about, I think. Philosophy isn't so much about getting answers, so much as it is about asking questions and sharpening our sense of what's at stake in those questions. And so if I've done a bit to help you sharpen your sense of whether or not you think of death and immortality as negative or positive or something in between, then I'll take my job to have been at least somewhat successful. Now, I don't pretend like these lectures have provided any conclusive resolution to any of the questions that I've raised, but I'm also not sure that exactly is what philosophy is for. I don't mean to say that philosophy isn't interested in answers. If it wasn't, none of the authors that I've presented would have tried to provide any. But I feel like the answers that we provide are maybe secondary in importance in comparison to the questions we ask and how they shape our sense of what's at stake in answering them. And so if I've maybe sharpened your sense of what's involved in asking about the goodness or badness or neither of death and of immortality, then I'll consider my job to have been at least somewhat well done. In any case, I appreciate you sitting through these lectures, and I hope you've learned something, and I've really enjoyed sharing these thoughts with you. So thanks very much for coming along on this brief ride.